Welcome to another episode. I'm here today with my former Marine Scout Sniper School instructor, Kalen Wojcik. How's it going, Kalen? It's going good, man. Thank you for the invite. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm happy to be here with you. Man, well, I, I'm beyond excited. I don't. I know that you can't possibly know this because I've I've been out for about 20 years now, and I know you were in for longer, man. But I have I share so many stories about you and the lessons that you taught me. I mean, you are a huge mentor, and and I always tell people about the the lessons I learned after the military because I feel like I was a pretty immature kid in the military, and I learned far more afterwards reflecting, and and a lot of that is you, man. I have so many huge life lessons that you gave me. So I'm thrilled to have you on here, man. Thanks for jumping on. Well, thank you, man. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, it's, it's funny that you bring that you bring that up because that's something that I've been reflecting on quite a bit lately is, um, uh, just how young we were at that point in time in our lives and the amount of responsibility that we had, um, that we, I, th I feel like we managed exponentially well in the grand scheme of things. Um, given the parameters that we have to work inside, you know, being, being inside the military. And, um, you know, I was, I was a young kid as well. Like, I think, um, I mean, I was in my early twenties when I was teaching at, at the schoolhouse. And so, you know, you look at kids now that are in their early twenties and you just go, Whoa, that's a mirror. You know what I mean? Like, I think the mindset is definitely different. Um, but I think the, that when people are, you know, in the military, you understand, I think the, the, the vast majority understands the gravity of what they're choosing to do and the path that they're choosing to take within the military and the seriousness of that path, um, and the consequences, because, you know, we both know that, um, uh, choosing those, choosing the path, like you as a reconnaissance Marine and, and me as an infantry, you know, as an infantry sniper, we're both infantry Marines at the, at the end of the day. Um, but the risk, the risk that you take that is, you know, it's exponentially higher, right? Because of the nature of our jobs that we chose to, to get ourselves into and looking at back and I'm just like, yeah, man, I was like 22 years old making snipers. It was crazy. You know, just like, wow you know, you have that power over somebody's dreams at that young age and yeah. you really do. Well, it's, uh, it's to the, I mean, it's one of the most impressive schools that I've ever been through. And I know there's definitely a lot of, you know, uh, recon versus scout snipers, um, and, and that just brotherly feud there, mm -hmm. but without a doubt, I was always blown away with the professionalism that, that all of you guys brought to the table. I mean, you guys were, never skipped a beat, just top notch. And it really blew me away. It was something that, that always stuck with me is, is how professional all of you guys were at all times. I, th I thought it was absolutely fantastic. So even at a young age, y'all were absolutely crushing it. So I really we, appreciate it. I you. had some, I had some really good, I had some good, I had some good mentors, right? Um, people that set me on a better path, you know, um, because you, there are all, there are the dudes that show up at that schoolhouse in any schoolhouse, right. As, um, you know, protectors of that badge and like they show up as teachers or instructors. They're not teachers because, you know, I, I kind of feel like there's a delineation between, uh, being an instructor versus a teacher and, um, instructors are, you know, you're, you're, you haven't yet developed into, um, your own style, your own method of delivering information. And I think that's the, that's that transition piece between being an instructor and a teacher. Um, and there's those people that show up and they're like, man, I'm here to get mine, right? I'm here to get mine. I had a rough go as a, as a, you know, as a candidate, um, you know, we can talk about the whole pig hog thing if that's something that you want to discuss, but you and I both know that there's, that there are people out there that are like, man, I'm going to, I'm going to get mine. Um, and they show up at that school and they're just there to lay the pain. And, um, you know, that's unfortunate. Now, does it lend to the experience of the student in some ways? Yeah, it certainly does. Like I would have felt robbed if I had, um, an easy go. Um, I don't feel as though that I did, but I would have felt robbed. Like looking back on it, I've been like, ah, oh, man, you know, that wasn't what I wanted. Right. Because I, that was my dream. That was my goal. When I looked at the military and said, this is what I want to do. Um, I have some lineage in my, in my family that, that is from the military. Um, my dad's father 
was uh, a paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne in World War II. Um, he did both. He jumped as well as flew gliders, which was really rad. Um, and he participated in D-Day on all the way through to VE Day. <clears throat> he got a couple of Purple Hearts and did the whole thing with the 82nd Airborne, which was just amazing. And I didn't realize how amazing that was until I was much later on in life, right? Because we don't have an appreciation for it um, until we have some lived experience under our belt. And uh, my mom's father was a combat engineer uh, in the army in Korea. And then I would later find out that uh, my my dad's mother, okay, so like this is one of those dad's mother's sister's brother's things, right? So my dad's mother's sister, so my great aunt, her husband, uh, John, fought with the Marine Corps in the 7th Marine Division um, in the Pacific Theater. And he survived four of the major island hopping campaigns to include Iwo Jima. So um, he never spoke of it. Nobody really understood. Um, my 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 father's two brothers were Marines as well. One was, uh, uh, he got out for 21 years. And then uh, my the younger brother of the four, he did four years in, in, in the air wing as an avionics guy. Um, so there was a long lineage of, of military history in, in my family. And what I decided to do was, um, I just decided that I wanted to be a Marine number one. And if I was going to be a Marine, I wanted to go to the sniper route because I was a voracious reader as a kid. And I read a lot of books. Um, I was reading novels by the time I was like 12 or 13 years old, like Tom Clancy, WB Griffin, um, Dale Brown, all that stuff. Like it, I was kind of a nerd when it came to that because, um, you jump into those books and you, and you, and you basically go into another world, right. And it's another, uh, it's another world and it's a story that you're, that you're consuming and living. And I mean, Tom Clancy was just so amazing at creating a story. It was just phenomenal. Um, and I just, I loved it. And so I was like, you know, I'm, I also enjoyed hunting. And so I was like, well, snipers, the, being a sniper is just the way that that's the path that I'm going to take. And that was exactly what I did. And what do you still read a lot of those books today? You know, I haven't, um, it, it's, I wish that I would have more bandwidth to do so. And this okay. is, just, that's just me that I need to, that I probably need to reorganize and restructure my life to be able to do that. Uh, but a lot of the books that I read today are more, um, centered around like leadership development, um, productivity management, things like that. And, um, I do read a lot, uh, my wife studies psychology. And so that's something that we discuss quite a bit in our household, um, the books that she consumes and then, then I'll consume the books. Um, she's kind of like the North star when it comes to understanding the self. And I've gleaned a lot from, from that. And so that's kind of where my focus is right now is more personal development, uh, leadership development and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. Well, then that's, I'm, definitely on that path every now and again. I grab one of those books. I picked up a, I used to read a lot of Vince Flynn books, similar to Tom Clancy, not as in depth. Um, his are much shorter. I feel like with Tom Clancy tell, tells a very in depth story with many characters, whereas Vince Flynn mm -hmm. has always kept it to be a, a little bit, it, it's a little bit quicker of a read, um, yeah. but great stories. But in any case, uh, I definitely love the leadership books and I can see why, I mean, a big, with this background that you have in your family, is that, that really what drove you to join the military? I think so. Uh, more along the lines of, I always wanted, um, I grew, it, obviously like weirdly enough, I mean, people look at this and they're just like, wow, I didn't ever, I never thought that, but like, I got picked on a lot when I was a kid. Um, I didn't really fit in if you will. And I know everybody has their story about, you know, their struggles growing up because everybody has those struggles. I have a 13 year old boy right now and he's experiencing those same struggles and all the other parents that I just, that I talk to their kids experience it as well. Um, so for me, where I found solace from that was, um, was hunting and fishing and being outside. That was something that I really, that I really enjoyed. That was where I felt um, the most at peace and that I could really be myself. Um, and so I did spend, I, I mean, I had a couple of core, a core group of a couple of friends that we always did things together. We would always go hunting together, or go fishing together. Um, but largely I spent, I spent a lot of time by myself. 
and, um, and thinking and, uh, sitting in a, in a tree stand or sitting in a ground blind or, or fishing. Um, and so I was able to kind of sort things out and say, well, you know, if I didn't have that great a time in school, um, I had an okay time, I guess, but I didn't like it. It wasn't something that I was like waking up and being like, oh, I can't wait to go do this today. It was just like, well, I was on a swim team. Um, I started swimming in seventh grade and I really enjoyed it because, um, I wasn't super into, uh, like basketball, football or any of that stuff. And in that realm of athleticism, but I could swim my ass off. And that was something that I really enjoyed to do because it was hard and it was, it was not easy. And, um, my, my skill set allowed me to, to dabble between sprinting as well as distance and endurance. And so I had a pretty decent mix in my training. So some days I'd be focusing more on, uh, on, on the short sprints versus, and then some days I'd be focused more on developing my long game for the longer races, like the 500 meter freestyle, things like that. So that really allowed me to tap into understood or, or, or just like lean into understanding what my body was capable of along with my mind. And that was kind of like the start of the understanding of the mental game, um, when it came to, uh, perseverance. And I wanted to experience what that was like. I want, I, cause I read all of these stories, right. I read all of these stories about people's experience in, in combat and war. Right. Um, because I wanted to know what that was. I wanted to understand what my grandfather's experienced, right. I wanted to understand what they, what they did. Um, and if I could do it. And, and, and so that's why I chose that path. Um, it's funny because, you know, we look at things like mathematics. Um, I stopped taking mathematics in 10th grade because I could, and I was just like, well, I'm going to join the infantry. So I don't need this. I don't need all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the The path that I took in the military, um, with the realm of long range shooting and understanding external ballistics and internal ballistics, it's all mathematics. Um, Internal ballistics is all calculus um, and statistics, and external ballistics is all trigonometry, physics, and geometry. So um, I kind of shot myself in the foot there, but uh, <laughs> I was able to uh, have some good people surrounding me. I don't. Do you remember Owen Mulder? Yeah, I do. So Owen, um, Owen's big time contributor to Modern Day Sniper and Modern Day Rifleman as well, um, and we bring okay. him out to teach. Um, he went into the realm of physics for a while because external ballistics fascinated him. And then he decided that, um, after a couple of trips to Afghanistan as a MARSOC operator, he started to realize that the, that the psychology of how all of this works was more fascinating. And so he decided to, to split off from physics and go into psychology and, um, he's brilliant. He's a, he's a really, really sharp dude, um, brings a lot to the table and, um, he teaches a fantastic class, uh, that he calls the psychology of observation. And he was also one of the guys that stood up the Marine Corps combat hunter program. So, um, that, and that combat hunter program for your listeners, it, it's a school that was teaching, um, uh, interpretation of human mannerisms, um, through understanding psychology. And so, uh, or, you know, the basic level of psychology. And so when you're trying to interpret somebody's uh, body language, when you're trying to interpret somebody's intentions through optics, you know, a thousand meters away, you have to understand like how do, how does this particular demographic of people, right. Or this, um, this geographic region of people, their mannerisms, what are they doing and what does that mean? Um, and it was allowing people to make more intelligent and responsible decisions about whether or not they could make an engagement if that was an enemy combatant or not. And so, um, that was really huge for him. But, um, so yeah, I mean, I, oh, I just, I enjoyed, I enjoyed learning all of that stuff. I love that. And it just brought me back to, um, cause I remember one of the things that I, I do share that I loved about being in sniper school that, and I don't remember how often it was, but it, it seemed like it was frequent enough that I could recall it. But I remember at the end of some long days, y'all would pull us into this room and, and give us this scenario. 
where we had to split up across I mean, you had like 10, 15 seconds. I don't remember the time frame, but basically shoot or don't shoot. And then we would unpack kind of the, the ramifications of it. And that was one of the things mm-hmm. I really respected about what y'all brought to the table. It wasn't only how do we do this, but how do we live with this after the fact? Sure. You know, because yeah. you've got to live with this, you know, the, the bullet is a, it's a instantaneous little pull of a trigger, but then mm-hmm. you live with that for a long time. And, and one mm-hmm. of the many things I really respected about what y'all brought to the table was, was that. So it's no surprise that, that he went into this realm of observation and how to do that, because I remember y'all bringing that. So that was really cool to see. Yeah. The, the, the tactical, the tactical decision games, the TDGs, right? So you just say, Hey, this is the situation that's presented to you. Um, how are you going to handle this? Like, how would you, if you were, if you were the only one making decisions and these are your assets, this is your left lateral limit, your right lateral limit. Uh, here's the commander's intent go. And that's the beauty of how our command structure is, uh, is put in place that the lowest common denominator, the lowest dude understands at least what the commander's intention is. And he understands that mission statement. Well, he's been given the mission statement. It doesn't necessarily under- mean that he understands it, um, but he's been given it. And so that is, you know, we, like witnessing what's going on in current conflict and how, um, and how these organizations are organized and how they execute their plans. It's very clear, like in the, in the Russia-Ukraine conflict right now, we can learn a tremendous amount of, of information about how those two organizations are structured and how um, their leadership is structured or their lack of leadership is structured. And it's very, very clear. Uh, and it's a great learning point, especially on the very, on the, on the low end of the spectrum from the strategic to the, to the tactical level. We're learning a lot about the tactical level of things from this conflict. What stands out to you with that for just, let's say on the Russia side, I mean, what, what stands out to you as, as far as their leadership and, and how that's being run? It's a set, it's all centralized command. So, um, most of the men have no idea where they are. Most of them don't have maps. Um, a lot of them didn't understand that they were actually in Ukraine after they had crossed the line of departure and moved into the country. Um, nobody understood what their mission was. They, they still don't. And it's basically like, Hey, you're just, you occupy this. Here's the front line. You're occupying this. Okay. Well, then that just means that I have to kill the invaders. Okay. Well, you, they don't understand the bigger picture. Um, and that's, and that's where the, the separation occurs with the, you know, the United States doctrine, um, and other countries that follow our doctrine versus the Russian doctrine of warfare. It's all based upon attrition and the generals and, you know, the, the higher up level officers are the ones that have all, they're the gatekeepers, right? They have all that information Mm -hmm. and it all depends on whether or not they're going to disseminate that down and how low they disseminate that down on the chain of command. Mm. And so just not sharing it. And, and you can see that uh, pretty clearly that they have no idea where they're going. And mm-hmm. yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Yep. Um, so my buddy's over there, yeah. right? Go ahead, please. No, was, Your buddy's no, over I was going to say my, my buddy's over there um, right now. He's uh, one of the guys I was with at, at First Recon. And hearing some of the stories, the stuff that he shares about it is uh, absolutely incredible. It's unbelievable mm-hmm. to hear this stuff, but hearing you say that that's how he describes it is like these waves of people that are just kind of like coming. He said, it's just an endless amount of people. And it's almost like they don't care to, they feel like they have this endless amount of people. And so I wonder how much of that drives their lack of, you know, cause they feel like they have this endless resource of human bodies to throw at it. Yep. Cause he said it just, absolutely. they're just waves of people that just rolling in. So that is their doctrine. Historically, what? that's their doctrine. Yeah. So getting back into your time in the military, just so anybody can hear it, what was your time? You joined the Marine Corps. Mm. Uh, when did you join? What did your time in the military look like if you were to have a, a yeah. um, so short I joined, elevator pitch of it? I joined when I was 17. Um, I wanted to get out. As, I wanted to get in as fast as possible. Um, so I spent, um, I was a, I was a, I'm a fall baby. So my birthday is in October. And, um, I probably should have been, I probably should have been held back a year. Um, 
that's, that's what I did with my son. He's a September baby. But, um, so I graduated very early, um, and I had my 18th birthday when I was in boot camp. I shipped out to boot camp in September of 1997, um, and I went right into infantry school in North Carolina. I was I'm a Paris Island Marine, and I went to North Carolina for infantry school, and um, I enjoyed it big time because you know my infantry school was in january i've graduated uh, recruit training in december so i had like two weeks off and then you go right into infantry school and it was cold it was wet uh, we got snow um but i had already been taught how to deal with all of those things and so all of the other dudes that were like living in the suck i was actually partnered up um, my hooch mate if you will um we both understood like how do we water? Cause we were still using shelter halves at that point in time. And it's like, how do we waterproof this thing? How do we make sure that we stay dry? How do we stay, how do we stay warm? Um, and you are, you're living in the field for you know a month, you know how that works. Um, and I was just like, this is badass. This is exactly what I wanted to do. Um, so I went to a, a West coast battalion. I went to first Marine division, which was a big surprise for me at the time when I got my orders. Um, I was only like a 13 or 14 hour drive away from home being at Camp Lejeune because I grew up in Western New York outside of uh, Niagara Falls. And so I was like, oh yeah, like, you know, 18 years old, I'm still thinking about the high school girlfriend type thing. And uh, this is going to work out this way. And and then all of a sudden, bam, you open up your, 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 your service record book and you see Victor 2-1, First Marine Division. And you're just like, <laughs> this is not supposed to happen. <laughs> what do you mean I'm going to California? Um, and all the instructors, I got super nervous and um, all the instructors were just like, hey man, check it out. I would literally give my left testicle to you right now to get off of Camp Lejeune and go to Camp Pendleton. So be happy. <laughs> uh, and they were not wrong. Um, I was able, to, I was fortunate enough to to get it, to maintain my, my short career in the Marine Corps um, on Camp Pendleton. So, and I'm grateful for that now, having been to all the Marine Corps bases, I'm like, yeah, they weren't kidding. So I uh, went to Camp Pendleton and I was in the, I was in the, the straight infantry as a, as an O three fifty one um, uh, anti-tank assault man at that point. And I was assigned to a weapons company. So I was firing uh, dragon missiles at that time. Um, it's kind of a, it's a legacy weapon system. Uh, and my job was uh, as an assault man, attached to a weapons company was anti-armor and uh, we did do a little bit of demolitions i uh, got a chance to go to some really cool demolition courses and um that was awesome and then it was kind of like my first reintroduction to math because there was some mathematics involved in doing uh calculations for charge weights and um you know how to how to shape the charges to you know defeat whatever obstacle or barrier it was that you were trying to do or trying to defeat and um that was a tough time because I wanted to go into the sniper program and I didn't really truly understand how it all worked. I kind of knew the the framework of it. I was like, everybody that I asked said, you got to go to the infantry. And then when you get to your infantry battalion, you got to find the sniper platoon and figure out when they're going to do a selection. And I was like, okay, well, then that's what I'm just going to do. Not understanding that once an infantry battalion has you, <clears throat> that company doesn't necessarily want to let you go. Right. And so they have to let you go. Uh, and I didn't understand that at all. And I was like, well, I want to go take this in doc. And, and my squad leader was, um, was just young man, you know, looking back, really not great leadership. Um, that whole senior Lance corporal thing. And it was just a bunch of dudes running amok, right. With, with not a whole lot of leadership. <clears throat> and so they were terrible infantry Marines, they were, they, they had no desire to, to better themselves. They were just buying their time to get out. Right. These guys were on their, on their second deployment, right. They're salty. And they're just like, you know, looking back on that, the salty Lance corporals type thing. And, um, they're, they're just still, you just don't know anything at that point in time. Um, and so I didn't really have a great experience in that realm. Um, because the leadership wasn't, wasn't that great. And so when I did join the snipers, the, the sniper community, that was like, Oh, thank God I can, you know, I thank God I can get out of that and I can go, I can better myself over in this organization. And I immediately saw that opportunity and it was fantastic. Um, 
went into the sniper section. I did one Western Pacific float as a, as an infantry Marine. And that was a good thing. And I think it was a good thing because it allowed me to learn how the infantry worked and showed me uh, where by learning how the infantry worked, it showed me as a sniper, how to best support that operation and or then that organization. Um, because if you don't understand how the infantry works and you don't understand the basics of how attacks are formulated, how these, how these things are like, what is a base of fire? What is a maneuver element? What is a support element? Um, you don't learn those things as a stay baby, right? And we call them stay babies for the listeners, a stay baby stay stands for uh, surveillance and target acquisition. And that was what sniper platoons were, were labeled as, um, when I first got into the mix and a stay baby was a guy that just finished infantry school shows up to an infantry battalion as a drop, right? So like infantry battalions will receive, you know, 60 men from a graduating infantry school. And they're like, Hey, you're going to the second battalion. Okay. Well that out of that 60 men, they're going to figure out what men go to what different companies and what organizations, right? That's just manpower aspects of things. So sometimes stay babies would be guys that would automatically go from that drop straight into a sniper platoon. Um, and then they're going to go through the selection process when they get in that organization, but they, they really miss out on understanding how the infantry works, like range 400 at 29 palms. Um, whatever your feelings are about that training evolution, neither here nor there, but it lines out perfectly how an integrated company sized attack on a, on a defensive position is supposed to run. And so if you don't understand how that works, it's very difficult for you to support that operation, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, that was a good thing. And, uh, going, I went right into regimental sniper school, which was horrific. Uh, that was a really, really difficult, uh, crucible to go through just because it, there was no standardization and that, that school was six weeks long and it was kind of like pre sniper. And, um, we, they just wanted to make sure if you were a Marine in the first Marine regiment, you were not getting a slot to the division level sniper school that would offer you the occupational specialty, the numerical designator that says, Hey, you graduated. Now you have attained this title. They wouldn't let you go unless you went through the regimental sniper school because they knew that that regimental sniper school is going to prepare you to pass the division level course. And so it was very severe. Um, six weeks of, again, like there were just senior snipers running that program. There's no curriculum. It's not, it's not monitored by anybody. Um, and it was kind of like the wild West over there at Camp Horno in, uh, <laughs> you know, in 1999, it was pretty wild. Uh, there were many nights that we didn't get released back to our barracks rooms until one thirty, two o'clock in the morning, um, with weapons draw at zero five the next day and an hour and a half long of quizzes, uh, that if you didn't pass with 70%, you were getting failed, you were getting dropped. And so there's a tremendous amount of physical stress, a lot of mental stress. And, um, you know, the fear the it was more of the fear, of the unknown, because if you know, when something's going to end. Typically speaking, you can kind of like get your mindset in in a, in a way that you're like, okay, I know that I have to deal with this up until this point. But if you don't know when it's going to end, that's when the real game gets played and you have to go, how much am I willing to take, right? How much of this bullshit am I willing to take right now? <laughs> um, and uh, And so that was a big thing for us because we didn't know. Um, they're like, they would forget to feed us sometimes and be like, oh man, I forgot to, I forgot to let the pigs go to chow and, you know, behind the wall locker wall, you know, in the, in the, in the old squad base, cause you can hear everything the instructors are saying. And you're just like, man, they forgot to feed us. Like, I guess we're like, we are pigs. We are, we're yeah. like, <laughs> we're farm animals. So, um, and that was, it was a good experience because, um, moving into combat operations, you don't know when anything's going to end. You're, you don't know. There is no definitive to anything. Um, and that prepare, that will prepare you for understanding or, or learning how to deal with those, those circumstances in the future. Um, left that went into, I, I went to the basic course. I was actually the last scout sniper school 
that graduated from division schools at the first Marine division level. And we actually moved all of the shit on my chill week, um, ended up being moving all of the gear from the Margarita schoolhouse, um, over at division schools to school of infantry over at, uh, at the, uh, 52 area. So, um, uh, that was an interesting thing because that's a, that was a lot of history that was getting moved from that schoolhouse to the new one. And it was a dramatic change because I mean, you were at Margarita, you were at Camp Margarita, right? You're kind of out in the middle of nowhere there. And, um, aside from it being division headquarters, you know, you can go behind the barracks and get a lot of things done, so to speak, you know? So, yep. oh, yeah. um, yeah, <laughs> there's plenty of training area out there to take care of things. Um, but then being like having the sniper school right at the flagpole of the school of infantry, like our office, when I taught there, um, before we had the Quonset hut, uh, my, I shared an office wall with the battalion commander of advanced infantry training company, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, infantry training battalion there at, um, uh, at school of infantry. So we were under a lot of, a lot of, uh, a scrutiny just out of where we were. Right. So you had to mind your P's and Q's. Um, but, uh, after I graduated that course and, and went through the basic course, I was able to, um, get into what we would call, uh, the, the MU or the Marine Expeditionary Unit. And when you're designated as a Marine Expeditionary Unit and you get assigned to a Marine Expeditionary Unit as an infantry battalion, you get a chance to go through some pretty cool training and some pretty cool schools. Um, I got a chance to go through Urban Reconnaissance and Surveillance School. I got a chance to go through the Urban Sniper Course, um, participated in a lot of, uh, in all of the training events that, that stemmed from those courses. Um, I did a lot of stuff, uh, reconnaissance missions out in uh, off base. Um, out in town, so to speak, we would go out and get mission assignments in like San Jose, Los Angeles. Um, Hey, you know, you guys are going to insert here. You're going to link up with these people. You're going to load all your crap in these vans. They're going to take you to an insert point. Um, and they tried to make it as realistic as they possibly could with the resources they had available. And I thought at that point in time, you know, the early two thousands, that was some really realistic training. Um, and, you know, like, you know, a bunch of white dudes running around like big, you know, tall muscle, muscle bound white dudes running around, um, you know, East LA, you don't really fit in, <laughs> you know, yep. you, you don't really fit in, but the nature of the training was, um, was very impactful on us, even though mm. it wasn't super realistic. Um, so got a chance to do that. Went on a deployment as a, as a sniper team leader, uh, another Western Pacific deployment. Um, had some really cool opportunities on that trip as well. And then when I got back from that, that's when I decided that I was going to go teach at sniper school. Um, it was either going to be the urban sniper course, um, working for special operations training group, or it was going to be the basic sniper course, um, at school of infantry. And, um, at the time it just seemed like the better decision to go teach at the basic course. Um, the special operations training group route, um, it just didn't, it just didn't end up materializing and working out. So, um, great experience there. You know, I learned a lot about how the Marine Corps worked. Um, I learned a lot about how, uh, you know, the behind the scenes stuff like range scheduling, training area scheduling, all of the logistical aspects of things that are kind of like, you don't really see unless you're, unless you're the one doing it type thing. And so it definitely gave me a a, a bigger appreciation for, um, you know, the leadership on the, on the operational side, like your platoon sergeant, your operations chief, um, the things that your platoon commanders are dealing with just to get you the ability to train, just to get you the ability to shoot your rifle. These dudes are staying up late. They're doing things after hours because that's when they have the opportunity to do them. They're dealing with all of these bureaucratic, you know, little entities within the, within the military that are, make you want to, freaking gouge your eyeballs out with a pencil. Um, those are the things that, that I learned working at sniper school that I have now a new appreciation for because it got you to be able to see the bigger picture. Um, and those are, that's huge being able to see the bigger picture, the faster you can see the bigger picture and the younger that you can start to identify the bigger picture, the better off you're going to be in integrating yourself into those goals. 
Mm. And how does that apply? So tell me some more about that. So it just caught me off guard. I was thinking of something else and then you, I love what you just said there. So the, the faster you can, you can do that. And, and how does that mm-hmm. apply? Um, so I guess I'll, I'll open it up with a little bit of a story. Um, you know, we're all at that point in time, being young, um, as a young Sergeant, I was, you know, 21 years old, full of piss and vinegar, um, thought that I knew everything. And, um, we were getting ready to get on board, um, a ship for a training exercise. And my team was going to be uh, assigned to the long range helo reconnaissance. Uh, long range helo raid reconnaissance. So we were only going to spend maybe like 36 hours on the boat. And then we were going to get on helicopters and go get inserted for the six day long patrol and reconnaissance mission. And so with that comes obviously a lot of planning, you know, this, right? So you got a lot of things to accomplish, a lot of things to do. And while we're sitting, um, in the company area, we got everything staged out on the grinder, which is the parade deck. And you have the entire battalion waiting to get on school buses, white buses, and head down to San Diego to embark on ships. So obviously there's a lot of shit going on, right? So I hear that we were tasked with duty on board the boat and snipers are attached to headquarters and service company. And that's where all the pogues are. And again, this is that, that bigger picture thing, right? Um, those pogues, that's where supply is. That's where admin is. So you have all your S shops, right? So your S shops, your S1 is admin. They take care of your service record book. They make sure that you get paid. They take care of all your leave. Uh, You have S2, which is your intelligence assets. You need to work really, really closely with those guys as, as, as snipers. And you are part of that in the S2 shop as snipers. Um, Then you have S3, which is operations. Those are the dudes that are making sure that you have beans, bullets, and band-aids um, and organizing all of that and how do you get it and how you, and how the grand scheme of things works in terms of the operations on the, from the strategic level down to the tactical level, um, as it would relate to an infantry battalion. And then you have the S4, which is supply. Those are the dudes that are getting you that stuff. Or, and then the operations guys are disseminating it out type thing. And then you have S, uh, com and that's where the motor pool is. And that's where the where chow is so these are all of the dudes that that get you the stuff that you need right in order for you to do your job and i think we do a really terrible job at teaching these young guys that this is like how it all works right this is these are how these lines are all connected and i think the the younger you are that you understand that the better of an asset you're going to become so i'm on the grinder and i hear that we have duty And I get pissed and I'm just like, this is, you know, I'm saying all these expletives. Um, I'm just being an, an, an arrogant punk, right? I'm, I'm a 21 year old arrogant punk at that point. And, um, my platoon Sergeant Robbie Reedsma at the time, um, I still talk with Robbie, uh, now because we're both in the firearms industry, but, um, very, very mild mannered guy, uh, never heard him raise his voice. Uh, up to that point anyways. And uh, I'm sure you can probably see where this is going. Robbie gets fed up here and Kalen run his mouth. And Robbie decides to go staff sergeant reads my on me. And I completely deserved it. Um, I got, I got fully dressed down in front of the entire infantry battalion. And Robbie did a fantastic job doing it. it. Made me feel about that big. Right. And that was exactly what I needed in that moment. Um, and because what I didn't understand in the background, what Robbie was doing, Robbie was an excellent diplomat and what he was doing was he was breaking the cycle of how leadership viewed snipers and recon Marines leadership in the Marine Corps always looks at us in these specialized, um, jobs as being special. Oh, you think you're special. Now you're not special. You're actually just a Marine still. And us being young and immature, we're just like, oh man, I just went through all this BS over here to be special. I am special. Recognize me and respect me for being special. But that's not how it works. Nobody cares, right? So like, we don't understand that nobody cares. Um, So we show up with this level of arrogance, wearing a black, wearing black sweatshirt in the company area. It's like, 
you as a platoon sergeant now in a like older with leadership, you want to smack that dude up the side of your head and just be like, you deserve what you get. But shit rolls downhill in the military. And so everybody suffers, right? Because now you're grouped into this conglomerate. And what Robbie was doing was he was trying to break that cycle by saying, no, man, my boys are going to be different. My boys are going to integrate and, and be, be Marines before this, their job. And I know a lot of people, I've said that before at, at sniper school graduations, being guest speakers and stuff. And I've seen, you know, gunnies roll their eyes at me. And it's just like, hey, man, even if you're, if you're a gunny, you're wearing all those stripes and you're rolling your eyes at me with that, you got a lot to learn, son. And those lessons are going to, they're going to come. You're going to get smacked around uh, by the universe until you learn those lessons um, because they, they will come. So that whole be a Marine first, that was Robbie, what Robbie was trying to do. And he was trying to get the, he was trying to restructure the level of respect that, that these upper echelon command structures, um, would have for us later. And, uh, and it paid off, man. It really paid off. Robbie really shifted things. And I, I couldn't see that until I had that little, that micro death of my ego, right. In that moment. Um, and I think that's going to tie into other conversation, you know, more of the conversation later on that we've discussed prior to the sh- to, to us, you know, hitting the record button. But that was a really defining moment in my career. Um, and it showed me that, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything. Right. I, I, I have so much to learn. Um, and I took that to I took that to sniper school. And that was the big picture. That was just the the that was like lifting, just lifting the veil a little bit of understanding what the bigger picture was and saying like, Hey man, this is bigger than you, buddy. Like this is, this is way bigger than you. Um, and so teaching younger guys to see that earlier on and embrace that is only going to make things more coherent. Oh, and I love that story and where my mind went with it as well as not only, obviously that's a very powerful thing in the military. And I saw that in the schoolhouse and kind of pulling back big picture of everything that we are now as veterans. And I think that one thing that I've seen is a lot of people don't know what they're doing big picture in their own life. And it makes it really tough to know what to do today because I don't, I haven't laid out big picture, you know, yeah. and I think a lot of people struggle in life and that's what I, I love that aha that I didn't have until you shared it, but that until you define what, what your goals are in your life, big picture, it's going to mm-hmm. be a struggle to know what to do day to day. So I, I think it, yeah, it really applies you don't to have a lot a of things. Star, you know, if you, my wife and I talk about this all the time, uh, my wife went through a massive transition in her life. Um, and she, you know, she came to realize she's like, I don't have a North star anymore. Like now that I, and now that she's like, I, I, I finally figured out what my North star is. And it will totally reshape your outlook when you wake up every day, right? If you don't have a North Star, you wake up every day and you're just like, well, what should I do? What do I have to do? What should I do? But when you have that North Star, you can look at it and go, this is what I get to do today. This is what I get to do to reach my goals, right? This is what I get to wake up and do these things. Um, and that's a major shift. That's a major, major shift. And it can be just that, just that simple, right? Um, so, and you can completely change your outlook on things. Why do you think so many people, and, and I, I say this not pointing fingers because I, I was this way for a long time. Why do you think so many people struggle to get that North Star put out in front of them? Oh, man. Um, I, I think this, you know, it starts to get into like the psychology of things. Um, but. I think that there are a lot of societal structures in place that say that we have to do certain things that don't necessarily align with what our soul wants and what our soul needs. Um, you know, you see people, you see people work in jobs and you know, it's not for everybody. Right. So, um, I could not go back to doing the nine to five thing. No way. I've worked for myself for 15 years. Um, well, I've worked autonomously for 15 years remotely. I've worked for myself for the past almost six years. Um, But I had a job that allowed me to work remotely with very little, if any, um, management. 
And I was just like, Hey, you're going to go teach courses. And this is what, you know, whatever you got to do to teach your courses, here's your resources, go do that. Be successful. Um, but the people that are working that nine to five every single day, and you're feeling like, um, you're just unhappy. You have no joy. Um, you don't really want to get up and go to work because it doesn't fulfill you. But society says that you have to society says that that's, that's what you have to do. Right. Um, you should just be grateful that you have a job type thing. And I think that as we move more into, as our, as our society is continuing to expand, um, it can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. Right. In the sense of like, it's going to shape, um, I wouldn't say permanently, but it's going to temporarily shape the the direction of the nation and how it's and how it moves in that direction. Um, we can see it now with like the creator culture. The creator culture says that if you have this thing, right, this little rectangle, you have like one of the most powerful computers in your hand. You, there's literally nothing you can't do with that thing. So if you want to have your side hustle, bring that thing to fruition and chase after your dreams. Um, you can do that nowadays. You couldn't, it was very difficult to do. <clears throat> you could do it. It's part of the American dream. Um, but there was just a lot more barriers for entry, uh, years and years ago. And now that we know those barriers of entry are, you know, lessened, if you will, it just makes it a lot easier for people to roll into that. Um, and now is like, after like, take for, take, for example, this, this whole pandemic, if you, I'll put it in air quotes, pandemic, right? What did that show people? That showed people that I don't have to go to work. I can actually work from home. I can do what you and I are doing right now, right? And um, I can I can produce revenue from that. Um, and it's it's definitely shifting how everything rolls, right? And so people are able to pursue their own individual um, goals and their own individual joy with a little bit more ease nowadays. I think mm. that makes a it makes a ton of sense and being able to put it out in front, hopefully people can grab that because I think that without having that, just as you pointed out, that North star, you're not going to, it's going to be really tough mm -hmm. to find happiness in life. I yep. mean, it's going to be really tough to find fulfillment, happiness mm -hmm. without knowing what direction that you're headed. You know, whereas you said, if you have it, you wake up in the morning and you know what you get to do. It's not yep. what I have to do. It's what I get to do. Yeah. And, and it's, it's honestly, really well my, my wife was a huge, huge driving factor with that for me. Like she helped me, um, to change my, to, to change my thought process, to change the words that I use to describe the things. Um, you know, she, she was, you know, my wife had the business side of things. I had the, I had the niche side of things, meaning like I had the, I had the ability to deliver the information and be the subject matter expert. And she had the ability to, uh, to do the business and establish the tech, uh, to make it all work. And, um, you know, she calls it the trifecta. Um, and so she was like, yeah, we got the trifecta. So we're going to go ahead and give this thing a go. Um, but, um, so I guess we kind of got diverged a little bit from the military yeah. career thing, but, um, I think it's all good talking points. But, um, so after my tour at, at school, at the schoolhouse, um, I got solicited to be, uh, so I really wanted to go over to first force. My, my path at that point was I wanted to go to first force recon. I wanted to take the, take the selection and I wanted to go be a dude, just a dude. I didn't want to be in a leadership role. I didn't want to be a team leader. I didn't want to be an assistant team leader. I just wanted to be a dude. And I wanted to learn what that was like to develop myself first without having to worry about developing others. And I think that's really important for everybody to at least have that opportunity to do, because I think sometimes in the, in the military, uh, people that display, um, good leadership traits and characteristics, and they can perform well, they're constantly being moved in and put into those roles and they're not able to develop themselves first. Um, and that's something that I really wanted to do. And my ultimate goal was to end up at, um, at the unit over at, uh, the army's soft D at Delta. And that was like my ultimate goal. Um, so I wanted to spend a, a few years over at first force, um, learn how to be an, an operator, uh, get some more combat experience and then, um, apply for a package to be able to go take selection and assessment. Um, 
However, that didn't work out that way. Um, I got solicited to be the chief sniper of 3rd Battalion 1st Marines to go on a trip to Iraq in 2004. And um, I decided that at that point in time in my career, I was a senior sergeant and I was getting ready to be uh, in the zone, uh, my promotion zone for staff sergeant and having a combat deployment um, was pretty important at that point. And so I was like, well, I could go over to first force, go through that training pipeline, and it will be another year and a half, maybe until I get deployed into a, into a combat zone. Right. Um, maybe it wasn't the right thought process, but this, I'm describing the thought process that I had at that point in time. And so, um, the Sergeant major of third battalion used to be my first Sergeant at second battalion where Robbie lit me up. Guess what? That Sergeant major was my first Sergeant in that H and S company, Sergeant major Sachs. And, um, so our major Sachs was a man. He was a, he was a formidable opponent. Let's put it that way. Um, but the work, the work that Robbie did, Sergeant Major Sachs, when he, when he became a Sergeant Major, he had so much respect for what we did. And he knew that he knew that I was raised under Robbie's roof, so to speak. And so he knew, and he was, and he saw how I was developing, um, as a young Sergeant. And he was like, yeah, I w- you, you need to come here. Like you need to come here. And I sat down with him and I said, look, Sergeant Major, you know what I want to do. He wanted me to go be a drill instructor because that's his, that's his thing. He was like, you need to go be a drill instructor. And I'm like, I'm not going to be a drill instructor. Not me. It's just not in my freaking DNA, man. Like I'm not doing it. So, um, and for those of you guys who are listening, you know, if you guys are drill instructors, I love you guys, but it's just not in my, it's not my cup of tea. Um, <clears throat> so I told him, I said, if I come here to do this, you know what I want to do. I want to go to first force and this is my goal. Right. And I think because I was able to tell him this was like, I had this all planned out in my thoughts. And I think because I had a path and I had a direction, he was like, yeah, I'll, I'll help you get there. You come here, you give me one deployment <clears throat> as the chief sniper, pardon me, <clears throat> you give me one deployment and I promise you when we get back from this trip, I will cut you orders and let you go. And I said, even if I get promoted to staff sergeant on this trip, because I might. And he said, even if you get promoted to staff sergeant, I was like, okay, we shook hands <clears throat> and he made it all happen. So I did the combat deployment to Iraq in 2004. and um, it was a big trip and I didn't really realize how severe that trip was, um, later on in life until I listened to a couple of podcasts. I listened to, um, <clears throat> I listened to Cody Alford's podcast on the Sean Ryan show. Um, Cody Alford went over there and participated in the first, um, the first Fallujah go around in April of 2004. And I had, I would later come into country in June of 2004 and, um, and hear about the, the experiences of that was second battalion, first Marines and first battalion, fifth Marines. And so, uh, we did a kind of like a team leader drop, um, before those guys left in July, go back home. And we came on in June and the stories that I heard from those guys. And then what we would later experience going into Fallujah in November. Uh, later that fall, um, it was just, I didn't realize how much of that I had blocked out and, and dismissed from my mind because, you know, listening to Cody's experiences in that podcast, I didn't realize that he was, um, we actually were in a tent together, right? When we had that team leader drop, we were, I mean, he was a pig in that platoon. Um, and, and the team leaders were having a chat and he was there. So, um, he had that kind of like, you were like, yeah, that trip really sucked. That was, we lost, we lost a lot of Marines on, um, uh, KIA on that infantry out of our infantry battalion. And, um, I think something like 260 purple hearts were awarded. Um, uh, my platoon alone had, uh, 26 of those purple hearts. I'm sorry, 23 of those purple hearts. Some of those, uh, were multiple awards. And, um, I was, I was wounded on the first day of the 
of Operation Phantom Fury, which was the the attack on Fallujah, and um, I got uh, I got hit with a piece of fragmentation in my knee uh, and took me out of the fight. And um, it ended up being like a two year long recovery. It was a pretty severe injury. I'm lucky to have my leg. Uh, if the piece would have hit me, you know, maybe a centimeter posterior, uh, they would have they would have taken my leg right above the joint of the knee because of all the damage that would have been done. So it would have been ir- irreparable. So that dramatically changed my life, obviously, right? So my my progression, my career progression, my dreams, my hopes, my desires <clears throat> were boom, gone. And hindsight is always is always 2020. Um, but I look at that and now the prognosis was pretty nasty. The the surgeons were basically like, hey dude, you should be just grateful that you're able to walk right now, much less pick up a rucksack and a rifle again. So your days of doing that shit are over. So just get that out of your head right now. That was the messaging that I was getting from the medical, the medical professionals. And it definitely corresponded with the amount of pain that I was dealing with in the recovery process. So um, <clears throat> very reluctantly, I elected to uh, take a uh, take a separation from the Marine Corps um, from a medical board, and uh, you know it is what it is. Uh, it wasn't very easy. Um, I know we talked about the discussion of the transition. Um, I didn't realize how difficult that transition was on me in my early twenties until much later in life. Now that I'm in my early forties, um, that's a that is a that is a death of self. And, um, your identification of self, you're losing that and the transition, it's not post-traumatic stress. I mean, I'm not saying that people don't deal with post-traumatic stress. I mean, I dealt with post-traumatic stress, um, but the, the stigmatism that goes along with that, everybody deals with that stuff in a different way. You know, you, you can have these clinical definitions of, well, if you have PTSD, you're going to experience this, 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 and this according to the DSM. And it's just like, nah, it doesn't work that way, man. It, it just doesn't. Um, everybody experiences it in a different way. Everybody copes with it in a different way. But I think the majority of what guys like us in the military that are transitioning out of that deal with, it's a loss. It's a grieving process. And we don't look at it as a grieving process. We look at it as you have to, um, you have to reassimilate into society. It's like, okay, reassimilate, eh? So how old were you when you joined the Marine Corps, Thad? I just just turned 19. So just turned 19. So were you assimilated into society at all at 19 years old? No, I had no idea what I no was doing. No idea, man. I certainly wasn't at 17. My only assimilation, I assimilated into the military. So I don't understand how anything else works. I don't understand how society works. I don't understand what am I supposed to integrate into? I'm not reintegrating. I'm integrating fresh. Mm. And I'm also dealing with a loss of an identity that I held very, very dear to me. And it was what fueled me. That was my North Star that get that, that got me up every day, right? Do I want to get into the ocean at, you know, two o'clock in the morning? And Finn a thousand meters? No, not really. Um, but I get to. Right. So that's that type two fun that um that we've all grown to to appreciate, right? Um, so that's what happens, I think, when people transition. It's a loss, it's a grieving process. And we don't get taught how to grieve. And most dudes will will uh you know revert to whatever they know, booze, chasing women, uh, making poor life decisions, you know, whatever it is. Right. Um, and so, and really too, like the really, really crappy part about it was, is when, when I went through that whole medevac process, that was in 2004, we had just started, we were just scratching this, the surface of what it was like to be a nation at war. We were at the fledgling stages of that. They didn't know what to do with us. They had no idea. There were no, there were very, very few systems in place. And and honestly, I would go to the hospital and they would hand me 
two bottles of Percocet, dude, at the counter. I'm like 24 years old. Two bottles. Here you go. When these run out, come back. And you're like, dude, that's, that's no wonder people are lost. No wonder dudes don't have a direction. No wonder so many people are getting hooked on that stuff. And oh wait, okay, well, I'm going to take some pain medication and I'm going to go throw a few beers back with the boys at the barracks. That's people's existence. And it's totally unmonitored. It's totally unregulated. And there are very, even today, there are, there are very, there are more resources, more resources out there for sure. And there's more awareness, but man, 20 years ago, no, not even close. And it wrecked a lot of dudes' no, lives. There, and I remember after getting back actually, and it just sparked up memories that I, I didn't have until you shared it, but actually having buddies that, um, had, similar or similar, but different experiences where they would have a ton of meds and it would, like you said, just kick it back in the barracks with yep. there's no regulation, no nothing. I, I, I really appreciate though. Cause I, I think it's an interesting perspective of it's not reintegrating into society. When you get out, you're integrating because I think most yeah. of us, I know I joined because I, I didn't know what to do. I knew I didn't, I grew up in a, a not a great scenario. We didn't have much growing up and I just knew I didn't want to be where I was. Mm -hmm. And this was a, you know, I joined up right before nine 11 happened. And so it was, that wasn't, um, uh, on my, my thought process, but for me, it was, I don't know what to do. So I'm going to go here. Mm -hmm. And I love how you pointed out just that it's, you still haven't figured out how to integrate. You haven't figured out what that looks like. And so you, you said you realized after the fact how difficult it was mm -hmm. and it, not so much during your time of transition. Mm-hmm. I realized like there was a couple of defining moments. Um, uh, I, when I got out, I came here to Washington state to work for a family business and, um, a lot of visions of grandeur, um, uh, instilled a lot of hope. And that ended up being an incredibly toxic environment. And, um, and what I quickly realized was like, how important was integrity to us? Thad. How important was that to us in the organizations that we, that we lived in? Everything. I mean, that's everything, right? Yeah. Everything. Um, now you might, we never were exposed to like that upper echelon, like that, you know, that, um, you know, that Oh five and above type echelon, right. Where you're occupying those positions and you, and you, you are, a, you have to become a, a politician in certain senses to be able to advance, we didn't really see a lot of that stuff. And, and the, the, you know, what we saw was dudes that we looked up to and respected and that we knew were going to freaking do the right thing. Right. I knew that I knew that my ops chief, if he said that that shit was going to get done, it was going to get done. If my platoon commander said that it was going to get done, it was, you know what I mean? Like we, we relied on that and we took integrity very, very seriously because lives depended on it. And I quickly realized as soon as I got out that integrity didn't mean what it meant to me in the civilian world. And I had people like blatantly lie in front of me. And it was people that I actually like that would disregard the things that I had to say because it would, um, it would rock boats or it would be a situation that had to be addressed or handled and when i when i realized that they would that there was a choice we didn't have a choice right it was just like you're going to do the right thing period end of story but in that it, like outside of that realm that was just a really rude awakening to me is like is this my existence like am i going to have to continuously navigate all of this and it got way worse <laughs> so it got way worse as i got you know farther into learning a little bit more about business and dealing with those characters and um it really helps to look at people through the lens of archetypes and i learned that from my wife instead of trying to make things so personal you look at them through the lens of that's an archetypal structure um and not necessarily taking it personally um but i had to learn that i had to learn that through trial and error um, and through a lot of, uh, a lot of universal slapback, 
if you will. Well, so tell uh, us about yeah. that. What is that? The archetypes? What do you, what do you mean by looking at people through that lens? So, um, the archetypal structure, right. Um, you're going to test my knowledge here and that's good. So the archetypal structure is something that's kind of based off of mythology. And so if we look back at like Greek mythology, Roman mythology, things like that, you have these, these figures and these figures represent, um, specific models, I guess, if you will, like at the very basic core level, we have a father archetype and we have a mother archetype. The father archetype, the archetype is the, the characteristics and traits that we would associate with that person or with that character. If that makes sense, yep. then you could have a trickster. You could have an archetype that's a trickster. You could have an archetype that's, um, you know, a, a you know a dark archetype. You could have that's that represents evil tendencies. Um, you could um, have an archetype that represents, you know, kind of a beat around the bush, if you will. And these archetypes, um, Jungian psychology, uh, Carl Jung focuses a lot on archetypal. Uh, discussions and saying, Hey, like we shouldn't be taking this personally because everyone, every one of us has these archetypal structures within us. And we pick and choose our persona picks and chooses which ones we're going to put on display to accomplish what it is that the psyche feels like it needs to accomplish in this given scenario. And so with each of those archetypes though, there's a polar opposite. So you can have the good side of an archetype, and then you can have the polar opposite side, right? The negative aspect of it. And that's that whole Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type thing. That's that, that, that good and evil aspect. And that's something that, um, that, uh, depth psychology, Jungian, Jungian psychology focuses on and, and, um, you know, Jungian psychology focuses on really like the, the self and understanding, uh, the understanding of individuation. Um, it, like you are your own individual soul and, you need to to learn what that is by understanding that you have both a dark side and a light side, right? So you have an ego, you have a persona, and you have a shadow, right? Um, the the persona is what we show up like when I'm talking to you right now. I'm I'm putting forth a persona, um, and those personas we can have many of them, and we pick and choose which ones that we that we feel as though or that the ego feels as though that's going to get us through whatever scenario it is that we're being faced with. The ego's job is to keep us safe. The ego's job is to protect us from having the shadow revealed. Uh, and the shadow is all of the, is all of the things that, um, that we find, um, uh, I guess, um, repressive or undesirable, but we have, but we possess those traits. So, um, what I've learned through this and it's like, oh man, you know, we do that when we look at an individual and we pass judgment on an individual, that's literally because we possess the trait that we're witnessing in that individual and we just don't like it, right? We possess it within ourselves. We see it in somebody else and we're like, ah, look at what that guy's doing. It's like, no, nah, man, you have it in yourself. And so there's the saying my wife came up with is we, um, what we, what we project outwards is what we reject inwards, right? So anything that we see out there and we're pointing fingers, those are all projections, right? Um, because that's the ego doing its job and keeping the shadow the shadow is like the ego is like, man, my sole purpose in, in existence is to prevent this shadow shit from coming out. So the ego is then going to tell the psyche, Hey, no, 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 no. You got to put this persona on to make sure that this shit over here stays behind the curtain. Right. So that's where those, that's where the projections come out. Um, and that was huge. That, that's like one of those things where you're just like, Oh man, really? I got to, ah, shit, I got to deal with that now too. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. that's that personal development part of things. Um, and we, and, and as long as, you know, I think that you can bring it into your awareness, it's a game of awareness, right? It's, it's saying, okay, I do these things. Um, and these are, these are the traits that I have. This is the deck of cards that I've, that I have in my pocket. And this is the hand that I, you know, that I got dealt this morning. 
How are you going to play that hand? And that's learning how all of those three aspects of the psyche work together. I love that. Have you um, read the book or heard of it, the Loving What Is? No, I'm going to write that down. Mm-hmm. Loving. So it it sounds like it did very similar and on the level with what you're talking about. She describes it as a, a projector of, and it's very much uh, a buddy of mine read it. And it, she's out there. She's way, way out there. So uh, just as you listen to it, it's, it's an interesting, uh, an interesting read, but she describes it as a, the life, like we look at the world, it's a big screen and we mm-hmm. see imperfections, just like, as you're pointing mm-hmm. out there. And we yep. point it out and we say, there it is. But what we don't realize is that we're the projector. And the reason we see it so clearly is because it's not out there. It's, it's, it's on our lens. And yep. it's our lens that's causing us to see it so clearly out there. It's because it's on us. And that's so right. she takes everything and turns it around and says, well, I need to find this on me to fix. I, I, even read tell that. The world I will read that book. I'm going to I'll, I'll tell a, my wife about it. She'll get a kick out of it. It's a, that's it's right a, up my wife's alley, by the way. Yeah. Like, and I well, didn't I, I, learn this stuff. I learned this stuff from my wife. Like that I have to give my wife Cassandra credit for this because, um, uh, she was the one who really kind of like structured it and formulated it through her own trials and tribulations in life. And she was just like, why is this shit happening to me? Like, why do I? And so she went on this, this path of trying to, trying to figure this all out. And, um, it's, it's deep but it's within every, every single one of us has to deal with it in one way, form or another. And it's weird because like you see some things are just like, what, what doesn't bother you, Thad might bother the shit out of me. And what bothers the shit out of me, you might look at and be like, what's he getting all spun up about? That's because you don't, there's, you're not unresolved in that area or you are resolved in that area. And you're just like, that doesn't bother me. So, well, and having the ability to look internally, it's, it's pretty fantastic because everything I, I just did a, a big race, uh, two weeks ago that I wanted to train up for and do all the stuff. And, and my wife was very supportive. She's the most supportive. And that's awesome, man. We had a big conversation about it. And I remember thinking like, oh, I feel like she could be more supportive with this, mm-hmm. you know, because she's, right. I mean, she's tolerating, you know, I got to go to a 20 mile run on the weekend, which means she's got the kids for, you know, six extra hours on a Saturday. Right. And, I remember thinking about it, flipped it back on myself. I'm like, well, did I include her? Did I even tell her I wanted to sign up for this and like include her in the prep? And the answer was no, I didn't. And like at the end of the day, it went right back to me of I could have done a better job of communicating with her on my game plan. So it's it's pretty great. It's a great topic. So yeah, for sure. So you ended up getting out. You struggled with getting out. mm Mm-hmm. Um, just trying, I, I, I moved up here and I became a steel fabricator. Um, and that was kind of cool because I was learning a new skill and I went back to hunting and fishing. Uh, I didn't really have any time or opportunity to do that in the Marine Corps. Um, but it was, uh, you know, I didn't, I, I realized I was pretty bitter about leaving, leaving the Marine Corps. And so, um, I didn't really. I didn't really have a desire to get to go shoot. I didn't really have a desire to continue to do that. I thought in my mind, I was like, if, if I'm going to deal with this and I'm going to navigate this, I need to, uh, what I thought I was going to do is like, I need to pretend like this is just another, this is a chapter that I've closed and I've moved on and it just doesn't work that way. Um, and so it just kept poking me and poking me. And I was like, man, I don't really want to do this. I don't know what I want to do. I had met some friends that were like in sales and there was just a little kind of schmucky. And I was like, man, that's not, I don't want to do that. Like, what is it that I want to do? And I know that I don't want to, <clears throat> I don't want to be a welder for the rest of my life. Um, and <clears throat> that was kind of when I started teaching, I, I, people had found out like who I was, my background. And they were like, Hey, will you take me out to the range and take me shooting? Sure. Yeah. No problem. I got to the range and then I started to realize that I was teaching people a lot more than I would anticipate. And, um, it led for, it led to me starting a really small business, just teaching rifle classes on the side. And, um, eventually that worked into, um, I posted a, I posted up a, a class on sniper side that I was going to teach. 
and I got a phone call from this guy from Surefire. Um, and his name is Derek McDonald and he was the, uh, the, the honcho for marketing for Surefire. <clears throat> and, uh, he said, Hey, I saw the class that you put up on sniper side and, um, you put up some of your, you know, some of your job history. And I saw that you worked for, uh, first special operations training group. And, um, I checked up on you and, uh, I reached out because the guy that used to be my OIC there, his name's Andy Christian. And Andy Christian ended up being a, um, a really, really well-respected, uh, commander in MARSOC. And, um, Andy was my last CEO and he wrote my final fit rep. And, um, so he was like, Hey, Andy said good things. And I want to give you an opportunity, uh, to help you with your business. And I would like to host a writer's, I would like you to host a writer's event for Surefire. <clears throat> Pardon me. And, uh, I was like, I don't know what, the, I don't know what that is. Sure. What do you, so what do I need to do? He's like, well, you need to give me like eight slots for free to your class. And I was like, okay. And I go, well, what am I getting out of it? And, um, <clears throat> he said, uh, you're going to get, I can't really put a finger on it, how much advertising you're going to get, but each of these guys is going to write like two to four articles and they're all going to get tied back to doing what you're doing. And I was like, all right, that sounds like a, that sounds pretty decent. Um, my, my ex-wife at the time, um, was not very happy about it and she really couldn't see, uh, she just was like, well, you're going to work this weekend for free. And it's just like, well, it's not, it's like, I'm not working for free. And there's a lot of, you know, residual that's going to come from this. And, oh, there was plenty of residual that came from it. Um, I think we ended up, you know, if I kind of added it all up, it was probably upwards of $300,000. And and if I had to pay for that now as a company for marketing, it is probably about 300 grand worth of marketing that I got from just working for free for four days. Um, and then that's really what set me, that's what got my foothold into the firearms industry. And um, it actually helped me get my job at Magpul, working at Magpul Dynamics as the precision rifle guy. Um, and that's, I started working at Magpul in 2011 and I've been doing this professionally full-time ever since. It's incredible. I love one of the things that, that I talk about often is just doing something, even if you're not sure what it is doing mm -hmm. something, because oftentimes the pathway we are going to take in life or that we is one that we don't see, but mm -hmm. the moment you step forward and I always think of it as like a, those, uh, as you step forward, the motion sent lights that yep. three more feet you can see. And that is what yeah. I saw with that is that you, you stepped into this thing. I'm just helping people out. And then all of a sudden, bam, and, and here yep. you are doing what you do. And that's incredible to see. So it's been a fun journey, man. That's amazing. I love it. And so that is, I mean, currently right now you're um, running, I don't know the, the structure of it, but you're, mm -hmm. you are running modern day sniper, modern day rifleman. Yep. So we started, um, I had a, I had a consultation. I, I left, I worked for Magpul for almost seven years and Magpul went, um, Magpul had a major shift in culture and that major shift in culture occurred after, um, after the company was purchased by a private equity firm, uh, go figure, right. That's just kind of the nature of the beast of, of some things. And, and it took full hold in this situation. And, um, the leadership structure was drastically changing. Um, I started to witness a lot of things in the corporate world, um, that were new to me that just, I did not have a palate for, um, and I wasn't willing to tolerate it. So I said, i I, I said my piece and realized that, um, in the corporate world that doesn't go over very well. And so it was like, okay, well, it's just time for me to leave. And, um, I, there was no way that I was going to continue to like, uh, allow my, my, my whole existence to be poisoned because of, it was a machine that, that I had no chance of even making an impact on. So I decided I'm like, I'm out of here. So I, I started a small consultation company, uh, worked for several companies as a consultant in the firearms industry, um, in the long range shooting side of things. And, um, my, uh, my current, uh, business partner, uh, Philip Vallejo, he's a Marine sniper as well. And, um, I saw him receive the, uh, scout sniper instructor of the year award. And I want to say it was 2017 at SHOT Show. And, um, we just kind of met in passing. I shook his hand, said, congratulations, man. Um, I, I mean, that's really, that's awesome. And, um, 
I started following what he was doing and I realized that he had the same kind of, he had the same kind of passions and he had the same ability to communicate information and he was a rock star on the competition scene. And so, um, he was looking to get out of the Marine Corps and start doing what I was doing. And lo and like what I didn't realize is that he was actually looking to me, um, and saying, I want to be, I want to do what that dude does. And so one of the other, uh, another guy, another friend of ours was like, Hey, would you get on the phone and chat with Phil? Um, he would, you know, he's looking at getting out and starting his own thing. And I couldn't think of a better guy to talk to about it. And when I got, when I got him on the phone, I was like, well, here's my recommendations. And this is, if I could do it again. Um, and if I had a mentor, this is the way that I would do it. And so Philip and I ended up starting a podcast together and, um, uh, I was a consultant for Gunworks at the time. And I brought Philip on as a, as an instructor for Gunworks. And Philip and I decided that we wanted to start talking about sniper stuff. And so that it was the genesis of the modern day sniper podcast. And so that was the main brand. That was what, what was just like, well, that's it. Okay. Well, this is it. And then that podcast exploded. Um, we're about to hit a million downloads. Um, and, uh, like, I think, yeah, we started it in, um, uh, January of 2020. And so then Philip was, we just, we started running training classes and Philip was still working at Gunworks. And, um, we just got to a point business wise, um, that it was like, okay, we can, we can bring somebody on. We can start expanding the team. And, and, and Philip came on board and, and modern day sniper was born. Um, and, uh, modern day rifleman is another offshoot brand. And what we started to realize was that, uh, people would send us messages and say, I love your brand, but, um, I don't feel comfortable wearing the word sniper. I don't feel comfortable with that. And I didn't even, you know, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't that forward thinking when we set this up. Right. And I was like, oh shit, that is potentially a problem. Um, if we want to expand into the civilian market. And so what we did was we held a summit and we called the summit, the modern day rifleman summit. And, um, that's, that stuck modern day rifleman stuck. And now we have two, we have modern day sniper and we have modern day rifleman modern day sniper is going to move more into, um, government training contracts, professional, professional training. And then modern day rifleman is going to focus on the civilian aspect of things, the competition, uh, the hunting, um, and the enthusiasts. Okay. And you have an, uh, congratulate. I mean, I'd love to hear the podcast. A million downloads is, I mean, that's a very, very impressive feat that, that not many podcasts get to. So that speaks volumes to to both of you guys. Thank you. And man. then your platform here. I also want to point out to the humility that because it that you guys have with it because you started it up just as a you know we're going to do this thing, and and you were open with with people sharing it, and it, mm -hmm. you didn't see. And it was it was cool that that people stepped up and said I don't really feel comfortable with it, and I, I yep. respect that they did that. But also <clears throat> your humility in that you know y'all weren't even thinking on that level, which is, yeah, it at its core it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We were just, you know, it's like, man, that's, that's awesome. Um, <clears throat> so Philip actually, Philip was, came up with a name. Um, and it's been a fan, it's been a great ride. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. We've learned a lot. Um, we were the first to bring uh, a digital masterclass, meaning like a full fledged, Hey, this is like five hours long, five hours of content. And we're going to cover all this information. We were the first ones to bring that to the table. Um, and, uh, we have a monthly training subscription service. It's called modern day rifleman advantage. And we have a, um, we have a community that, uh, was built grassroots. I think there's over like 6,800 people in there now. And, um, that's, uh, it's essentially, it's our own community that's behind a, a firewall. It's not a social media platform. It's not a Facebook group. It's not anything other than its own thing. And it's modern day rifleman. And, uh, you can find it at modern day And, uh, in there is where we host all of our master classes. It's where we host all of our live question and answer sessions. It's where we host our monthly, subtra uh, monthly subscription service. And, uh, it's fantastic to just watch. I mean, it literally turned into its own monster, right? So, um, 
we're in there and we're seeing questions. It's very kind of social media esque the way that the the structure is is uh, is set up in terms of like how you view information. But it was designed. The platform was designed with administering instruction uh, at the forefront. Right. So it's really good for that. And um, the byproduct is we have a we have a growing community of shooters in there that are all after one thing, um, and that is to improve. Uh, and and further develop themselves both, um, you know, with their skills as well as being better human beings. Mm. Well, I def I joined it recently, and mm -hmm. I, I've just really been blown away. I haven't been able to jump in as deep as I want to, um, but I've loved the content. I got to jump into one of the uh, the heroes' journey Zoom meetings where you brought somebody in. Oh, and yeah. it's just a really cool, really cool perspective. I love it, and and I also challenge. I've done several episodes, a good buddy of mine um, that I met another Marine, I met him out at a, just a local competition, a uh, long range competition match. And mm -hmm. we ended up becoming good friends. He's come on twice, but I always recommend to people, any veterans that if you don't know, if you're kind of struggling of what to do next, the long range community is very, very open. It is. I guarantee no matter where you're at, I guarantee you've got a local, a very basic local club match, which you can go jump into the sport and I say that because I would definitely go check out this website, jump on the modern day rifleman, get into the sport. It's, it's a great, it's a great platform just to have community, to have something that's driving you a goal. Mm -hmm. And there's so many good things with it. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So, um, and so the book that you brought up, uh, Lanny Basham's um, With Winning in Mind, we are going to be doing a uh, a book club reading. We have a book club inside there. I know people are just like a bunch of nerds, right? Doing the book club thing. But um, yeah. uh, we're going to do, um, I think the event is already in there. Uh, I, the, the date, the exact date escapes me. I think it's like late in December that we're going to do it, but we're going to go, uh, we just get in, gave everybody an assignment. Um, you got three months to consume Lanny Basham's uh, with winning in mind, and we're going to take it all apart. Um, and, and that's going to be the, for me anyways, like where my goals are, um, I've always wanted to take a shot at a national title on the, on the competition side. And I really, I've dabbled in it. Um, and so far I've been able to rely on talent. Uh, but right now with the shooting pool, the way it is, talent ain't going to cut it anymore. Um, and that's great. That's yep. awesome. Uh, there are some really phenomenal shooters out there and it's, it's, it's amazing to see. And this next year, 2024, um, I want to kind of immerse myself into that and, uh, and structure, uh, my season so that I can go, go chase after a national championship. I think it'll be fun. Oh man. So that's going to be 2024. Yep. Yep. We'll see how 2024 okay. shakes out. So how will we be able to follow you on this journey? Because I, I mean, I personally would love to see you oh. chase this down. Um, well, I'm, I mean, social media, um, I have an Instagram account. It's, uh, uh Kalen eight, five, four, one. And, um, I pretty much, that's where I, I post the majority of the updates of what's going on at modern day rifleman. Uh, modern day sniper has a YouTube channel. Um, I don't have a personal YouTube channel. I just use modern day snipers. So we post up things there. And obviously within the modern day rifleman network, um, we'll be doing things like, uh, a lot of people do match debriefs in there that are very comprehensive, um, very focused okay. on things that like Lanny's book focuses on, um, you know, uh, trying to focus on that mindset aspect of things because it's not something that is at the forefront of everybody's mind in this, in this world. A lot of people are chasing gear. Um, they chase the gear, they chase the gear. Um, and that's fair. Like you, like the saying is you should buy as many points as you can afford, right? But there comes a hard stop where it's just like, okay, you can't buy any more points now. You actually have to put the rubber to the road and uh, and apply yourself. Um, and in this day and age, with the with the level of shooter out there, you have to train and you have to you have to focus on training in order for you to um, stay in that mindset. Because doing putting together two days of of upper echelon level performance is where kind of things fall. You can do it for a day. But being able to do it for two days is another story. Um, and so there's a lot for us to learn from from Olympians such as Lanny in, in his book. I know you, in our first phone call, you re recommended it. And I mm -hmm. usually, if people recommend a book, 
it's like I put it on the list and I'm, you know, it'll go wherever it goes. But that was then immediate. I ordered it. I got the audible and I had a big long run. I started listening to it right away. I absolutely loved it. I digested it. I mean, I think I was done with it in two days. It was just yeah, a fantastic it's not a big, read. It's not a big one. It's easy to get through. Yeah. Easy to get. And it's just great content. I just, I was stopping. I have a hole uh, in my iPhone. I have a ton, just a, a, so, yeah. so many good takeaways. What do you, what are your top takeaways with it? I know you're, I don't want to take away from your book club debrief uh, that y'all are oh. going to do, but what are your top <clears throat> takeaways with winning in mind? Um, the top takeaways are having a, having a bulletproof uh, mental structure that you can fall back on. Um, and then the, the affirmations, the affirmations are, are big. I think that the affirmations are, uh, the, there's more credit should be given to those affirmations than, than I think a lot of people do because they work. It absolutely works. Um, and the self image aspect of things, because if your self image is not aligned with your performance, uh, then we're going to have major problems, right? If you're like, if I'm like, I'm going to go shoot a match tomorrow and I'm going to go down and shoot the, the regional finale for uh, the precision rifle series up here in the Northwest. And, you know, if you, if you need like one or two stages to get warmed up and get the jitters out, that's because your mental program is either kind of crappy or it doesn't exist at all. Um, so you can't afford to have two stages where you're just like, Oh, I'm going to take the first two stages of the match and kind of like iron myself out, you know, get the bugs, get, get rid of those butterflies. We shouldn't have butterflies, right? We should be able to have a, a strong, uh, mental structure in place that I can fall back on that takes me to visualizations. Uh, another thing that Lanny's big on is visualizations. And I think in shooting, because shooting is such a visual activity, um, that visualizations are really, really important for us to do. Um, and, uh, obviously just the dry practice aspect of things. Like, you know, he tells a story in there about how, you know, he had to go to school in Texas and he didn't have a range within a reasonable driving distance. And he had based upon his schedule in order for him to qualify, uh, he had to take nationals in order to be able to qualify for the Olympic team. And he only had like three days to do it or something like that. He practiced dry fire in his, in his room after his family went to bed for three to five hours a night five days a week and boom, you know, he goes in three days at those, at those matches and he, and he takes them all because he was able to visualize everything through dry practice and have a rock solid mental plan in place to fall back on. Um, and that's your only focus, right? I'm not worried about anything else externally. I'm solely focused on what's going on internally because my skills have been committed to subconscious competence. And I'm executing that with my subconscious mind and I am able to problem solve with the things that are in front of me externally with my conscious mind. And that's the ultimate, that's the ultimate goal. I, I loved his breakdown of getting these actions that we take into the, the subconscious mind and, yep. and how he sends us there and, and how much depth he has with it. Well, I always share, it's one thing that we talk about um, just in my, uh, my day-to-day -day work that I do as I travel and train, we talk about the mental side of things. And one example we share, because people can sometimes struggle with how powerful your mind is, your imagination and affirmations. And I think that one thing that can't be understated is, is how you have to be really intentional about it. You know, your mind is mm -hmm. really powerful. And I love the example of, I stole it from a buddy, but that if, if you ever, everybody's kind of had it where either you or your spouse or significant other woke up the next morning having a dream that the other one cheated on you or that you cheated yeah. on them. And like, how does that conversation go? It's like, right. You can tell them all day long and they do. It is, it is real. And it's yep. really tough to shake that feeling. And that's how powerful our imagination is. And so when you do the drive fire, when you're having this, you got to be intentionally focused on not thinking this is fake, not thinking it's not where you have yep. to be. That's a real vivid walkthrough. It's, it's powerful. Yeah. Stuff. Well, because your mind, your, your psyche doesn't know the difference between what you tell it versus what it perceives as reality, you know? So, um, yep. my wife's been trying to get me to do this. And I don't know. <clears throat> I'm thinking about it. She's like, let's go do a dark, let's go do like a darkness retreat. And like, let's go spend three days in okay. the dark alone. And I'm like, damn, that's okay. All right. All right. 
Cause that, cause you, your brain doesn't know the difference. You know what I mean? Like, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yep. it, you know, it's, uh, that's pretty, that's pretty intense. I mean, I've, the longest I've spent by myself without any human interaction is 10 days and, uh, 10 days in the mountains. Uh, I was on a hunting trip and, um, that was a super powerful experience. Super powerful. Not having any human contact for 10 days is, is pretty, uh, is pretty powerful because it's just you. What did you take away from that? Um, <clears throat> number one, that I love the mountains. Um, that's where I do all of my, that's where I, that's where I work on myself. <clears throat> the majority of the time, that's like the mountains are my medicine. Um, and just perseverance, like uh, ultimate perseverance. The weather on that trip was garbage. Uh, it rained probably 80 to 90% of the time. Um, anybody who spent that much time in the rain, you know, that everything's wet. Um, it's uncomfortable, it's cold and you really, you know, it defines who you are in the sense of like your level of discipline and commitment because there's nobody else to get you up out of the tent in the morning. Right. So alarm goes off at four 30, <clears throat> it's freaking 12 degrees outside. The wind's blowing. Um, it's really easy to stay inside that sleeping bag. You know what I mean? It's really easy to stay inside that sleeping bag and say, ah, I'm going to get up when the sun comes up. So I'm not freezing so bad. Um, or like, okay, I finished my breakfast. I finished my morning meal. So now I got to strip off all these warm layers, go down to, you know, just a couple of layers because I got a ruck three or four miles to my glassing spot. And I know that's going to be super, super uncomfortable. It's just having the discipline to do these things without being told to right? It's all, it has to come from you. If you want anything in the mountains, you got to go do it yourself. Everything's work. You want to eat, you got to work. You mm. want water, you got to work. <clears throat> you kill a deer. Okay. Well, I got to go, I got to go to where I shot it and I have to cut it up and I have to put it in bags and I have to put it on my back and I have to get it where it needs to go. So yeah. that's one of the reasons that I just love doing it. Many of the reasons. I, I love that you said mountains are your medicine. Yeah. Mountains well, are my medicine. Really, really. That's great. Very, very powerful. Um, you said earlier and, and you shared a really, really powerful. I mean, your, your time in the military was very impressive and really powerful. I mean, you've, you did a lot. And I know you said you joined up with the hopes of, of understanding a little bit more about what your grandfather did. And mm -hmm. I, I really wanted to ask you if you felt like you got that. You know, it's, um, it's interesting. That's a good question to ask. Uh, cause when I came back, <clears throat> when I was able to finally get back to my hometown, um, after, uh, I got through with the medevac process, you know, my grandfather was still alive and, um, like he was super emotional and he was just, he, I remember him looking at me and going, I can't believe what, like, I can't believe what you went through. And because he, they're watching it on TV, right? Because they didn't have that stuff back in his day. You know, they weren't watching the war on TV. Um, and it most certainly isn't even like it is today. I mean, geez, you, certain Instagram sites you can go to and Telegram sites, you can pretty much watch combat all day long if you wanted, um, which is new. This is a new thing. And I remember thinking to myself, like, my grandfather fought at the Battle of the Bulge, dude. Like, I mean, there was never a point in time where I was, where we were freezing to death. Um, there was never a point in time where I was down to my last magazine of ammunition. There was never a point in time where we were getting shelled to the point of driving men to insanity. Um, we never experienced anything like that. I mean, there were definitely intense moments of uh, intense moments of combat and witnessing really, really horrible things in terms of like, you know, the effects of IED blasts and uh, indirect fire and, and all, but nothing on the scale that those guys experienced. And for the length of it, like he would tell me stories like, yeah, I mean, there were times where it was just hours, hours of being pummeled by, art by artillery. And not little artillery either, not like 82 millimeter mortars. I mean, an 82 millimeter mortar is, you don't want that thing landing next to you. Let's think about 155 millimeter artillery shell. Like those dudes went through unspeakable, um, unfathomable experiences, right? 
and it, and it, and they to totally pale. And I believe they pale in comparison to what I went through. And so I tried to convince them. I was like, grandpa, like, <laughs> Nah, man. Like I, I love you, and and I and I appreciate this, but um, it doesn't hold a candle to you, man, for sure. Well, I think I remember after Najaf of the, my second deployment, in the O four O five. I was in mm -hmm. uh, Najaf, and there was a, a huge battle there at this mosque, and people were comparing it to some World War Two battles, and I'm like, there's no. I'm not taking away from what, what we just right. went through. Just, there's no possible way that this compares to any of that stuff. Compared. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I completely agree. And I'm always grateful that for me, I'm grateful. I got to be a part of our generation's war and yeah. for whatever mm -hmm. capacity, because you know, it seems like every generation has one. And you know, I, I think what I, what I learned um, also something that I, that I've been contemplating lately <clears throat> is, um, you know, we might not always, as we grow and as we start to learn, um, and establish our own points of view and our own opinions, when we're outside the constraints of the military, we might not exactly agree with how a particular conflict started. Um, and I think that's safe to say, right. I think that's very, I think that's completely safe to say. Um, however, what we will never stop is well, we will never stop is the flow of young men that are eager to not only serve their country, but to seek adventure and to, to learn and to ex gain through experience what that's like, test their mettle. Can I do this? Can I put up with this? Can I be within this? Can I, can I establish my own rank within this fraternity of, of, um, of savage brotherhood, right? We're never going to stop that. That's going to continue like from the time of history, right? From history's recordings, young men were always and always have been pursuing this call for adventure. And what the way that I look at it is it's our job or, or where I'm at and in, in, in what I do it's it's my job to train those men to be as effective as possible so that hopefully they can survive to continue on that that transition continue on that that um that evolution of of understanding um because it's just, it's not going to stop it's going to continue to perpetuate and uh they need it they certainly need it well it's I know that's what what drove me to it. Yeah, I had this exactly what you're saying. I just felt this calling to go do it, and it was. I'm, I'm grateful I did. It was. It gave mm -hmm. a lot to me. It was a really good, good thing for me as a as a young man, not not knowing what to do. So, yeah, um, absolutely. You also mentioned something earlier, and actually, before I even ask that, I want to just make sure that what are some ways that that people, cause I have, I have one more question I want to ask you about and talk to you, but what are some ways that people can follow? And I know you mentioned Instagram, obviously check mm -hmm. out modern day riflemen. I yep. definitely encourage everybody to join that, but what are some ways people can get in touch with you or, uh, follow you? Um, yeah, so the Instagram route again, um, and the modern day riflemen, and I do have a YouTube channel, um, modern day sniper.com is our main website. Um, but it's more of websites nowadays are kind of more of like brochures of what we do. <clears throat> um, but, uh, you can come to an in-person class. Uh, we teach in-person classes all over the country and now all over the world. Um, so if you want to check out a schedule and you want to come hang out with us for a few days and, uh, get some in-person instruction, go to moderndaysniper.com and look at our events tab and you can see where we're going to be. Um, our 2024 schedule is going to be released here shortly. Um, we're kind of finalizing some, some other ranges that we're going to go to. And, um, you know, our time might be, might starting to become limited because, um, we are working on some military contracts, which is kind of where we want to direct the majority of our efforts anyways. And, um, those contracts, should they come to fruition, our time is going to be at a premium with regard to other activities. So 
come check us out. Uh, see if we're coming to a range in your region, in your area. We'd love to spend some time with you. Our classes are not necessarily a class, so to speak. It's more of an experience. You're going to hang out with us and um, we're going to teach you some of the things that we know and you're going to have just a great time. You're going to have an experience. I thank you for sharing that and cannot recommend it enough. I would definitely recommend to anybody jump into it, especially, I mean, if you're um, new to the sport, jump into it. Uh, and if you're into the sport, definitely, definitely jump in and, and check out everything they're doing because it's fantastic. You know, with this too, and this, this just hit me, not the question I was going to ask you. And I just want to, cause it's, I know that as at the last time we talked, you're, you're really focusing on the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And as you've shared your entire archway, I can't help but see the hero's journey inside of everything that you're doing. You know, you talked about, you know, being this kid in high school, kind of getting um, uh, maybe picked on a little bit. I don't want to yeah, misquote absolutely. you. No, no, no. Kind of going absolutely. in the military and then I mean, you had your rebirth. I mean, uh, have you pieced that together and looked at that and kind of where absolutely. you're at now? Because I mean, you 100%. can look at that full circle and see it as an amazing thing. Well, the cool part about the hero's journey, and, and this is where... Um, you referred to him earlier. Uh, this was uh, when Dr. Chalquist came on <clears throat> as a guest speaker and talked about it. We're getting in and out like the hero's journey. You remember the OODA loop, right? Right. Observe, orient, decide, act. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the OODA loop is something that we should be getting into. We want to get into it as quickly as possible, process the information, get out of it as quickly as possible, and then get into it again as quickly as, right? It's like, it's a constant, it's a continuum. And I believe that the hero's journey, those 12 steps of the hero's journey, um, and you can break them down, you know, into three parts. Um, you have the normal world, you have the darkness that you go through, and then you have the return, right? With, and the return is back to the normal world, but as a new version of you, it be based upon the things that you've learned uh, through your darkness. And so we're constantly in and out of this hero's journey loop with every major aspect of our lives, right? Like every trial and tri tribulation is its own little miniature hero's journey as we go through that continuum. And, um, you know, you can look at it from a wide 30,000 foot view, or you can even narrow it down to more granular and say that, you know, these last three months I've been kind of in this loop right? Or mm -hmm. processing something. Maybe you're processing something that happened with a family member or something that happened at work uh, or something that happened um, in your personal um, goals. Like any number of things we can find ourselves in, in that continuum. And so I have learned a tremendous amount uh, about myself as a result of, of associating what my experiences are with this structure if you will. And, um, if, if your audience, uh, if your audience hasn't heard of the hero's journey, I would strong in this, in, in this, uh, in interest you look up Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey and Joseph Campbell, um, was pretty much, uh, kind of the driving force behind breaking apart the hero's journey and understanding, you know, what it is. Um, and it's very, very interesting. And Joseph Campbell is, uh, he's a, he's a brilliant mind or was a brilliant mind. He's not with us anymore, but still, I mean, his work is just listening to the man speak is, is impressive. It's, it's powerful stuff. And I, I love seeing everything that you're doing, your entire pathway. And I'm, I'm just happy and grateful that I've gotten to cross your paths on this journey now, uh, two, two yeah, separate man. times in my life. Um, one thing that we talked about in our previous conversation, and you even referenced it earlier, was the just kind of death of the ego and kind of leaving your ego at the door. Uh, why do you think that, just as a, a parting message, uh, why do you think that's so important to leave your ego at the door? Yeah, it's a, so I think that's a common term that people use is leave your ego at the door. Um, and obviously it's like kind of a uh, more of like a, you know, a blanket term. But we have to understand that the ego never leaves us. The ego is always there. Um, we have to understand our. We have to understand what the ego's purpose is, uh, because it does have a purpose. It's not always a bad thing. Uh, the ego keeps us safe. The ego keeps us um, in line with our morals and with our values. 
but it can also be something that can grow and evolve through awareness of what it actually does for us and the things that it protects. And so, you know, when you leave the quote unquote, leave your ego at the door, like when you come to a training class, that's specifically just being open to learning, um, open to new information and not allowing, um, not allowing the shadow aspects of yourself to get in the way of that. Because that's all the ego is doing is protecting the shadow aspects from coming out. Like, you know, the teacher might be telling you something that trips something in your shadow and you get pissed and you're just like, no, nah, I don't agree with that. Being aware of being aware of how that all works is going to is going to allow you to be aware of saying, oh, yeah, now I'm getting tripped up. I know what's going on, but I'm going to redirect right? I'm going to do a redirect and I'm going to do an offset like with navigation, right? We've come to this limiting train feature. I, I know it's here. I have to get around it. So I'm going to plot a route around it. That's all you're doing with quote unquote, leaving your ego at the door. But in order to, um, but in order to, in order to, to learn that you have to have the experience, you got to get, you got to get smacked around a little bit. I mean, for real, you got to get smacked around a little bit. Uh, and, and being smacked around, what I mean is, uh, is, uh, is like you're, um, you're getting these life lessons and you're going to continue to get those life lessons until you learn them. And if you don't learn them, they're just going to keep on coming and, uh, it can get pretty old. So yeah. you learn your lessons, <laughs> <laughs> it gets pretty old. That's, so. <laughs> That's one of my, uh, somebody shared it with me recently that, uh, just all the things that the problems you have in your life, they keep coming at you until you, yep. you learn from them. And that's when you get to move past them. But then understanding that you get another one that's going to hit you right in the face. Yeah. After that it's, too, it's a continuum. The, it's not over. Once you hit the next level, over. there's just more, you never stop with that. It's a, the Maxwell, John Maxwell, great. Obviously he's like the grandfather of leadership. Um, always shares that, he can tell where you're at in your life and what level of leadership you have based on how many problems you're dealing with. Because if you ah. no no leader, nobody gets to a high level and is like, I don't have any more problems. It's like, no, nope. right. it's once you graduate to the next one, you just got you, your, your problems just multiplied, yep. but you don't get to go to that next level until you figure out your current ones. So that's, that's and, right. Galen, yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time. You're welcome. To jump Absolutely. on here. Uh, I really appreciate it. You're um, welcome, man. This is a great conversation and uh, I'd love to continue it. Yeah, man. I would, I would love to dive deep dive into a lot of this stuff, man. You're always welcome back on the show. And if I can do anything to help out with, with you guys, just, just let me know. Thank you very much, Thad. This was uh this was great. 